Revelation chapter 12, and we're going to read the whole chapter, Revelation 12, 1 through 17 this morning. Revelation chapter 12, starting in verse 1, and we're going to go down to verse 17 this morning. And a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars. She was pregnant and was crying out in birth pains and the agony of giving birth. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns, and on his head seven diadems. His tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth, so that when she bore her child, he might devour it. She gave birth to a male child, one who is to rule all nations with a rod of iron. But her child was caught up to God and to his throne, and the woman fled into the wilderness, where she has a place prepared by God, in which she is to be nourished for 1260 days. Now war arose in heaven, Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back, but he was defeated, and there was no longer any place for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to earth and his angels were thrown down with him. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ has come. For the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down who accuses them day and night before our God. And they have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony for they love not their lives even unto death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them, but woe to you, O earth and sea, for the devil has come down to you in great wrath, because he knows his time is short. And when the dragon saw that he had been thrown down to earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. But the woman was given two wings of the great eagle, so that she might fly from the serpent into the wilderness to the place where she is to be nourished for a time times and half a time. The serpent poured water out, water like a river out of his mouth after the woman to sweep her away with a flood. But the earth came to the help of the woman and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed the river that the dragon had poured out from its mouth. Then the dragon became furious with the woman and went off to make war on the rest of her offspring, on those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. Let's pray together. And now, Father God, we ask that you would do the exact work in our hearts that each of us need this morning. Father, I pray you would open our ears and soften our hearts to receive from you. Lord, those who are far, would you bring them close? Lord, those who are running hard, would you encourage? Lord, those who are somewhere on the fence, would you draw near to you by the power of your word? Father, I pray that you would help me. Please help me. Please help me in this time. I am weak and needy, but you, Lord Jesus, give ear to me. Do not delay, but provide the help I need in this time. We ask together in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Christmas is the foundation for everything. Christmas is the foundation for everything. Everything that God is doing in the world and in our lives has its foundation on what happened at Christmas. Jesus was born to die. He was born to die for the sins of our body. Jesus was born to die for the sins of our body in his body. So he needed a body to do that. Christmas is the foundation for everything because at Christmas we celebrate the eternal Son of God entering history. At Christmas we celebrate the second person of the Trinity becoming a helpless baby. At Christmas is the foundation of everything because without the manger there's no cross. And without the cross there's no manger. 
Now, maybe of all the places in the Bible, Revelation chapter 12 seems like a strange place to come two weeks before Christmas. Revelation chapter 12 seems to be a strange place to learn about the Christmas story. But Revelation was written for two reasons. Revelation was written to clarify what was happening and Revelation was written to encourage Christians. When we understand what's going on in Revelation, it becomes about the most encouraging book of the Bible and, I think, one of the most clear books in the Bible. That's what this passage does. It clarifies what was going on at Christmas and encourages us to stay faithful. Revelation chapter 12, verses 1 through 17, is the story of cosmic Christmas and faithful Christians. Cosmic Christmas and faithful Christians. We see the story of that cosmic Christmas in verses 1 through 9. One of the reasons we struggle to understand Revelation, one of the reasons that instead of clarifying and encouraging us, Revelation confuses and scares us, is because our imagination is not filled with the Old Testament the way that the imaginations of the people who originally read it would have been. The people who John was writing to would have had minds soaked in the Old Testament. They'd have had huge chunks of the Old Testament memorised, and those parts that weren't memorised, they would have uh, at least known the stories and the highlights. But that's not quite true for us today, is it? So, the two images that we meet in the first few verses, the pregnant woman and the dragon, would have been really clear to those original readers, but, but you and I need to do some detective work to figure out what was going on. John tells us in verse, uh, in verse 1 that a great sign appeared in heaven. So John sees something, but it's a sign. It's a picture of something else. You understand that the sign that says, this way to the beach, is not the beach. That's a great way to ruin a summer holiday, isn't it? To, to confuse the sign with the reality. So this picture that John sees is a sign. It's a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars. So we need to do some Old Testament detective work and think, where do those word pictures occur prominently in the Old Testament? Well, this woman is described in ways that would have brought to mind Joseph's dream in Genesis 37, verses 9 and 10. Maybe you're familiar with the story of Joseph. Joseph has a dream, and in that dream he sees his brothers and his parents bowing down to him. Joseph, perhaps not very smart, then goes and tells his older brothers and his parents that they're going to bow down to him. But in that dream, his brothers are pictured as stars and his parents as the sun and the moon. Joseph's brothers, of course, were the, fa the fathers of the faithful people of God. Often, in the Old Testament, God's people were pictured as a woman in labour waiting for a saviour. So here's a woman who is pictured to represent the faithful people of God, and she is in labour. Verse 2 says she was pregnant and crying out in birth pains and the agony of giving birth. And in the Old Testament, God's people are often pictured as a woman in labour waiting for a saviour. Micah 5.3, for example, tells us, until the time that she who is in labour has given birth, then the remnant of his brothers shall return to the people of Israel. So who is this woman in verses 1 and 2? Well, this woman symbolises God's people longing for a saviour who will come to rescue Israel. A baby is coming through God's people for God's people. And that baby will rescue Israel. So that's a nice, comforting Christmas picture, isn't it? The, the next picture could not be more different. Verse 3, another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns, and on his heads seven diadems. His tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth, so that when she bore her child, 
he might devour it. Now, John helps us out here because in verse 9, this dragon is identified as the devil. So this dragon with seven heads and ten, seven heads and ten horns is identified as the devil. Now, that collision of seven and ten would have reminded those original readers straight away of the Roman Empire. Rome was built on seven hills divided into ten districts. Those stars in the Old Testament, again, always represent godless kings. Behind every godless secular system is the devil tempting and attacking believers. We don't have to worry about the Roman Empire anymore. We, the church has outlived it, just like the church has outlived every godless secular empire. But in every godless secular system is the voice of the devil whispering, did God really say? So here you have the woman giving birth, picturing God's people, picturing their hope of rescue, picturing their hope of a saviour, picturing their hope of a messiah, and, and waiting for that baby to be born is this huge, many-headed, many-horned dragon. Now, I'm not a betting man, and, and you know we're in church, so hopefully you're not either. But if you were a betting man, wh- whose money... Who are you putting your money on here? The, this terrifying dragon or this woman in labour and her baby? Seems completely hopeless, doesn't it? But isn't this when God breaks in? Every time you read through the Old Testament, every time the situation seems hopeless, every time God's people seem to have gone beyond the point of no return, guess what happens? God breaks in and God saves. We talked about that some last week, didn't we? Remembering how the Lord Jesus was born in the darkest period of Israel's history. When things seem hopeless for Israel, God broke in to save. Maybe that's your testimony too. When things seemed hopeless to you, when you felt like you'd gone beyond the point of no return, when you couldn't see any hope or any help anywhere, then God broke in to rescue. Then God broke in to move. God loves us, so he stops us trusting anything else apart from himself. God loves us, so he brings us to the point where we know all we have to depend on is him. Friends, let me tell you, until all you have is Jesus, you have something else to depend on, and that thing is going to let you down. Jesus isn't all you have until Jesus is all you have. But friend, let me tell you, if if your experience of this year has been every single thing letting you down, every single hope being crushed, every single dream disappearing, let me tell you, Jesus is still with you, Jesus is still there, and Jesus is enough. Jesus is enough. And even though you might feel forgotten, you are not forgotten. And even though you might feel let down, God is preparing to work. And if Christmas teaches us nothing else, it's that the light always shines in the darkness. So this seems hopeless, but look what happens next. Verse 5, she gave birth to the male child, one who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up to God and to his throne. So the woman gives birth, the the dragon doesn't kill the child. In fact, the child now rules the nations with a rod of iron, that Psalm 2 language, prophesying about the Lord Jesus And the child is caught up to God and taken to his throne. So in verse 5, John collapses the entire earthly ministry of Jesus into one verse. That's the whole gospel. Jesus was born, Jesus lived, Jesus died, Jesus rose again, and now Jesus rules. And the woman fled into the wilderness, where she has a place prepared by God, in which she is to be nourished for 1260 days. The wilderness was a place of of protection and provision. The wilderness was a place of relationship. After a a marriage in those Old Testament days, the, the newly married couple were euphemistically said to go into the wilderness to get to know each other a little bit better. As the children of Israel wandered across the wilderness, God protected them. As the children of Israel wandered across the, the wilderness, God provided for them. So verse 5, we see the Lord Jesus reigning from heaven. Verse 6, we see the church 
the woman, you and me, in the wilderness, nourished and protected for 1260 days. The next couple of verses, verses 7 through 9, show us the, the cosmic result of Christ's action. They show us cosmic Christmas. Verse 7. Now war arose in heaven, Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was defeated and there was no longer any place for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who was called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth and his angels were thrown down with him. Because of the work of Jesus, every accusation of the devil against you is thrown out of the heavenly courtroom. Because of the work of Jesus, because of Christmas, every accusation against you is thrown out of heaven. Because of what Jesus has done, because of Christmas, we can be confident in our access to God. Every accusation thrown out, the devil thrown down, the devil rejected, the accuser no longer having any influence to accuse. This is the foundation for our lives as faithful Christians. But how? How do we apply that? So far, sure, maybe we've done some some semi-interesting Bible study. But you and I need more than semi-interesting Bible study to get us faithfully through another week, don't we? How does Cosmic Christmas create faithful Christians? How do we apply what we see in verses 1 through 9? How does John make this big picture relevant to us? Well, I think the cosmic Christmas is the only foundation, the only true foundation, the only sure foundation for our lives as faithful Christians. There's there's so much treasure in verses 10 through 12. Listen to verses 10 through 12. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ has come for the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down who accuses them day and night before our God, and they have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, for they love not their lives even unto death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who, dwell in the, you who dwell in them, but woe to you, O earth and sea, for the devil has come down to you in great wrath, because he knows his time is short. Now, I, I, I'm not sure the Old Testament, I'm not sure the New Testament, rather, gets more practical than this. Have you ever felt guilty about your sin? Well, of course you have. In fact, if you haven't felt guilty about your sin, I, I, wonder, I wonder about your spiritual life. I, I wonder if you've ever met the Lord Jesus in power. Have you ever felt guilty about your failure? How do you deal with guilt in the Christian life? How do you not let guilt drag your heart down to the ground? We'll go to verse 10. You feel guilty about sin. You hear the devil accusing you. And the problem is the devil never has to lie, right? The devil doesn't have to lie about my sin. He just has to remind me of the things I've done. When you feel guilty about your sin, go to verse 12. The accuser of our brothers has been thrown down. The accuser has been thrown down. The one who accuses you in heaven has lost his influence. The one who accuses you in heaven has had his only weapon removed from him. The only thing that can condemn you is unforgiven sin. The only thing that can condemn you is unforgiven sin. And when Jesus comes, he dies on the cross to forgive our sins. So when the devil comes whispering in your ear and accusing you and telling you you're a sinner and you've got no business praying, there's no point in you reading the Bible, you should skip church this week. When the devil comes to you and tells you you're a sinner, remind him, yes, Jesus died for sinners. Jesus died for sinners. So let the devil's accusations drive you to the cross. And when you feel sin tempting you, And when you feel the need, when you need power to overcome your sin, go to verse 11. They have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb 
and the word of their testimony, because they love not their lives even unto death. Man, this, that's the whole Christian life explained in Revelation 12, 11, isn't it? How can we overcome sin? We remember that Jesus died for our sins. We overcome our sin by the blood of the Lamb. Jesus died for our sins. And by faith, when Jesus died, we died to our sins. Friends, that sin no longer has influence over you. You are dead to that sin. So you don't have to give in. You don't have to have a heart filled with envy or filled with lust or filled with desire. You don't have to be weighed down with guilt. You don't have to be overcome with sin. The end of verse 11 tells us that the Christians are people who love not their own lives even unto death. The Christian life is is daily dying, isn't it? The Christian life is daily dying to our sinful desires. And we can die to our sinful desires because of the blood of Christ, because Christ has died. And we find that as we die to our sinful desires, we don't live in this sort of void, but we discover by faith in the Lord Jesus, we're given something much better than our sin. When you're filled with fear about the future, cling to verse 12, we we live in a very fearful age, don't we? The last few years have really shaken our confidence in ourselves and they've shaken our confidence in our own cultural strength. So when you're filled with fear, go to verse 12. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to you, O earth and sea, for the devil has come down to you in great wrath. Why? Why has the devil come down in great wrath? Why is the devil at work? Why is the devil raging against the church? Because he knows his time is short. Because the devil has been defeated. The devil has been mortally wounded and he now is nothing more than an animal thrashing around trying to take as many people with him as he can. But his time is short. It's easy to look at the world and wonder if God is in control. But of course God is in control. We might wish the devil's leash sometimes was slightly shorter. But we know he is on a leash. And we know that his time is short. His time is short and under control. There's two final pieces of encouragement in verses 13 through 17. Let's look at those together. When the dragon, sh- when the dragon saw that he had been thrown down to the earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. But the woman was given two wings of the great eagle so that she might fly from the serpent into the wilderness to the place where she is to be nourished for time and times and half a time. The serpent poured out water, poured water like a river out of his mouth after the woman to sweep her away with a flood. But the earth came to the help of the woman and the woman opened his mouth and swallowed the river that the dragon had poured out from its mouth. Then the dragon became furious with the woman and went off to make war on the rest of her offspring, on those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. Maybe in 2022, you felt like the devil had it out for you. You're right. You're right. Maybe you're worried in 2023 the devil is going to come after you in a special way. He will. He will. Verses 13 and 17 tell us that the devil persecuted the woman that gave birth. Symbolically, that's you and me. This is the story of God's people. Living faithfully under spiritual attack. Living faithfully under temptation. Living as children of the light in the kingdom of darkness. This is our story. Friends, it's when the devil leaves you alone that you should start worrying. The only thing worse than struggling with sin is not struggling with sin. The only thing more dangerous spiritually than feeling under attack is not feeling under attack. Oh, before you were a Christian, the devil couldn't care less, right? He had you. He didn't have to worry about you. When you were a Christian that that wasn't really committed, not really serious, oh, even better. 
nothing the devil loves more than a Christian that just shows up to church on Sunday and never takes the scriptures with him out of the door. But when you stand up and try to be faithful, when you stand up and try to make a difference, when you stand up and try to follow Jesus instead of the spirit of the age, man alive, that, that's when the devil's coming after you. That sounds bad, doesn't it? But we're just reading sentences from the Bible here. This is our story. Now, I promised you two pieces of encouragement. All I've done is tell you the devil's going to be after you next year. So we better keep going and see what else is in this, in these few verses. Verse 14 promises us that we will be sustained under every attack. The woman was given two wings of a great eagle so that she might fly from the serpent into the wilderness to the place where she is to be nourished for a time, times, and half a time. Listen, in 2023, you will be sustained. Wherever Jesus takes you, and whatever attacks you face, whatever discouragements you face, whatever trial and trauma and sin and suffering comes your way in 2023, you will be sustained. Verse 14 tells us the woman was given two wings of a great eagle. Exodus 19.4 says, You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Isaiah 40, 31, But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount, mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Friends, whatever happens in 2023, whatever happens this afternoon, you will be sustained and you will be rescued. Verse 15, the serpent poured water like a river out of his mouth after the woman to sweep her away with a flood. But the earth came to the help of the woman and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed the river that the dragon had poured from its mouth. Egypt was saved through water, weren't they? When they left, uh, Israel was saved through water, weren't they? When they left Egypt, how were they saved? Through water. That water opened up for them and then it closed back over the armies of Pharaoh. Moses himself was rescued from the water, wasn't he? His parents put him in a basket, and he was lifted out by Pharaoh's daughter. Whatever comes, whatever floods of attack, sin, suffering, temptation, and danger come after you this year, you will be rescued. Cosmic Christmas creates faithful Christians. And here's the truth to, to imprint on your heart this morning. If, if you drifted off when Noah said amen, just, just come back for, for another three minutes because, because this is it. This is everything, right? This is the truth to imprint on your heart this morning. God loves you too much to leave you in your suffering. God loves you too much to leave you in your sin. One day, all sin all suffering will be not even a memory. It'll be gone. All because of Christmas. And Christmas is the promise of that. Christmas is the final salvo in the last attack of a long war. And it's a war we know that Jesus wins. It's a war we know that Jesus will conquer and rescue and nourish. Friends, you'll always struggle as a Christian. You will always struggle as a Christian if you think the foundation of the Christian life is what you do. You will always struggle as a Christian if you think the foundation of the Christian life is what you do. It's not. The foundation of the Christian life is what Jesus has done. Oh, there are things to do as a Christian. You should come to church, you should give, you should read the Bible, you should pray, you should share your faith, you should love your neighbour. Of course there are things you should do as a Christian, but, but they're not the foundation of your Christian life. Not your performance, not your work, Christ's work. Because at Christmas, Christ comes. Christ comes to defeat the devil, and he does. And as we hold to him in faith, Whatever trials and temptations 
next year brings, whatever trials and temptations this week brings, we know he won't leave us because he has conquered. Cosmic Christmas creates faithful Christians. The work of Jesus saves us, rescues us, sustains us, and one day will bring us to be with him. Let's pray together. Would you pray with me? Let's pray. So God, our Father, now we pray that you would take your word and apply it to our hearts by your spirit. Father, I pray that that we would be encouraged. I pray that those who feel like they are underwater, just drowning, would look to you and find that rescue and that sustaining they need. Lord, none of us know what the future holds, but you do. Lord, as we walk into an unknown future, would we know that you have gone ahead of us, that you are faithful, that you will rescue us. Lord, keep us faithful to you, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.